So um, yesterday, ah, yesterday was it yesterday. Feels like a long time ago. Uh, yesterday, yesterday yeah. we uh, we uh, talked about uh, the classicalizing model, and we uh, say that the classical two Dizing model, classical two D, uh, uh, has a um, mm, uh, duality um, that map. Uh, Basically, one value of temperature, say a low temperature regime to a high temperature regime, and vice versa. It also exchanges the um, lattice from a lattice to a dual lattice. Um, in the case of the uh, square lattice, the uh, dual lattice is also a square lattice. And using this duality, you, we can see, we can compute, for example, the temperature of the uh, phase transition in the classicalizing model. Now, uh, when we learn quantum field theory, we know that uh, a, a quantum field theory in say uh, d plus one uh, space-time dimension um, uh, when we formulate this theory in Euclidean space, uh, the path integral is the same as the path integral of a classical um, uh, start max system uh, in uh, d plus one uh, dimension at finite temperature. One can ask whether the, the same thing happened here with the um, quantum, with the Ising model. Is there a quantum Ising model that is uh, um, given? Um, um, that would give us the same uh, that can be mapped to the um, the the the, uh, the classicalizing model in certain sense. And in this particular case, the answer is yes. Um, if you go back to history, you remember that Onsager provided the um, us with the uh, exact solution to the Ising model, and one can uh, formulate Onsager relation as a map from uh, from the uh, from the classicalized, from a classicalizing um, model to some quantum mechanical system. And Onsager did that through a technique called the transfer matrix. So the transfer matrix basically is uh, um, from the point of view of the quantum mechanical system is a finite time evolution in Euclidean space. So uh, if you look at the um, any textbook, you will find how this solution uh, is done. Um, um, uh, for the purpose of um, looking at the duality, we are going to, uh, I'm going to describe a quantum mechanical system that is not exactly the, uh, uh, the system that is obtained uh, from the classical system through transfer matrix. But something that is very similar, basically, it's, and one can think about that as a quantum mechanical system that belongs to the same class, universality class, as that of the classicalizing model. Uh, this one has continuous time. So the only thing that um, make, it, uh, more, make it different is that time here is continuous, although space is still uh, the system still lives on the lattice, one-dimensional lattice. Okay, so in the quantum model, on each we have a lattice, one-dimensional lattice. Uh, each lattice site is uh, I, and on each lattice there is a quantum spin, spin one half s. So here I have an SI, but SI now is a, is a quantum spin. Uh, maybe in order to um, distinguish that with the previous uh, SI of the classicalizing model, I will call that sigma I instead. Sigma vector, where sigma is um, 
So this quantum spin in the uh, in the um, I assume that is live in the S equal one half representation of the SO three group spin group. So each of the spin can have um, can be in the spin up and spin down uh, um, position, but uh, since it's a quantum spin, that means that the Hilbert space, there is a Hilbert space uh, of dimension two to the n. So each um, each side of the lattice, we can have either up or down spin. It's a quantum system defined with the following Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian I'm going to write down is sum over sigma i sigma i plus one and here i sum over sigma x and minus h sum over i sigma z i let me quickly uh, tell you how this um hamiltonian arises from um the uh, transfer matrix as one um, when one try to solve the uh, um, the the, uh, the classical Ising model, so in the the transfer matrix is basically a map. Basically, one write down the exponents e two minus beta h of the classical system and decompose it into the product of different matrices. Each of the matrix can be thought of as a time evolution. Uh, we treat one of the coordinates in the the classical Ising model as Euclidean time and the, the other the other axis as space. And the partition function is interpreted as a trace of uh, certain e2 minus uh, h delta t, well, let's say delta h uh, to the power of n, where n is the number of time steps. And when you write down this delta h, you see there are two parts of this delta h. One coming from the this link, horizontal link in the original classical Ising model. And that corresponds to uh, this term, the horizontal links in the same time slice. And then there is this uh, vertical links in the classical Ising model. And when you work out this um, map, we see that this one is this vertical links. These are the horizontal links. What is H in the classicalizing model? What um, is H? So, um, um, it turn out, yeah, I, I can, yeah, um, I'm hesitant to say because actually you don't get the the same Hamiltonian as this one, but it's actually a product of, um, of two different exponents. One is this exponent of e to minus j sum over this x. And the other, the other exponent is the time evolution uh, across here. Um, they are both related to, to k. Uh, uh, when we make time continuous, we combine them into just one Hamiltonian. Um, so the map is not exactly um, one to one. So. So is there a reason why you wrote the vector for the spins? Like I understand the matrices are vector, but uh, the spins can only be up or down, right? Uh, the spin is only up, up and down. Yeah. So when you say the same symbol sigma for the matrices and for the spins, is it? Yeah. Here it's a little bit. Um, I, I mix up uh, uh, a bit of notation. So here, what we on the on the uh, you can think about this on each side. Um, this is an operator that acts in the Hilbert space at each side. And on each side, of course, the state that can leap on each side is some kind of linear combination of up and down. But the spin is an operator that acts on the sub-Hilbert space of a given yeah. spin. Okay. Yeah, how does, how does the classical to quantum uh, transition happen here? Uh, in the when we write down, remember when we um, do classical mechanics of a Ising model, we have to take a sum over all the possible configuration of spin, and that sum is interpreted as uh, taking 
uh, matrix product and taking the trace over uh, a matrix of um, um, certain operator uh, taken to the end power. So, yeah, I actually don't know how uh, on circuits um, uh, work out his um, wrote down originally his solution, but um, but this is how uh, I would do that now. I first map it into a, a quantum mechanical problem of a discrete time evolution and then solve for uh, for the um, eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian. Now, uh, now one thing, uh, another thing that um, I gloss over is that when we do that, actually what we find is that um, in this term, there is sig the, the, the term that uh, we get here is actually product of sigma z. It's not sigma x. And this term is, is sigma x. But because of the rotational symmetry of the problem, we can rotate the basis to rewrite this into a more canonical form, where in the um, uh, energy of interaction between two different spin, we have sigma x and uh, the uh, uh, um, the second term we have sigma z, and there is a reason why uh, people like to uh, write the Hamiltonian this way. Okay, so here this Hamiltonian has a discrete. So um, the 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 uh, the um, an quantum analog of the z two symmetry of the Ising model is a quantum z two symmetry. A quantum z two is the discrete um, transformation that map x sigma x at um, uh, one place to minus sigma x and sigma z to just sigma z. Basically, one can think of uh, a rotation along the around the, the z axis that would uh, flip the sign of uh, sigma x. So um, the Hamiltonian is invariant under that Z2 symmetry. It's a discrete symmetry. It's not a continuous symmetry. There is no conserved uh, charge uh, in the usual sense that would commit with the Hamiltonian. OK, so now in this model, um, what is important uh, for the algebra can think about this uh, sigma x and sigma y as object that satisfies certain um, commutation relations. So, for example, sigma one of the important things is that sigma x and sigma y, um, sigma z, anti-commute at the same point. Also, uh, um, for this particular representation, they they, they square to one x square equals sigma z square equals one. Now, one can now um, discuss duality. So now that it's possible to map this theory to another uh, uh, theory basically rewrite the same theory in a uh, different form, and that can be done exactly. So here, let me introduce new matrices. Let me call that new, new x and and new y. So just to clarify, you are considering this quantum mechanical system at zero temperature. Um. In the in the quantum in this system. case, yes. we can just think about this as a quantum mechanical system, and um, whether one poses a question of uh, zero temperature is and a finite temperature, it's our choice. If you have finite temperature, the equivalent Ising uh, problem would be uh, um, Ising model on a, on a cylinder. That would be a, a, a equivalence of uh, this uh, Hamiltonian in finite temperature. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, but this, um, this, this duality that I'm going to write down is going to be um, 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 
palate for any temperature. It doesn't know about temperature. So I'm going to this define new spins that lives on uh, the dual lattice, which in this case is just the site in between the site of the original lattice. And I will define uh, the spin this way. So mu z at site n plus a half is the product of two sigma x at site n and sigma x at site n plus one. And the mu x at site n plus a half is the product of all sigma z site n say i with i less than n. Here I assume that the system has an n, so this 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 product is from zero to n. So it is now an easy exercise to check that these mu satisfy uh, what is needed for the uh, um, for it to be the z and the x components of spins uh, on 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 a local at each side. Namely, you can check that mu x, for example, mu x and mu uh, z at the same side anti commute um, and they anti commute only when these two sides are the same and the operator would commute otherwise and they square to one for example all this can be checked It's an exact mapping, but uh, one thing that we see here that the map is uh, non-local. That is, um, uh, mu x, for example, is expressed in terms of the product of all the z component of in the other representation from basically from one end of the sample to to that point. And then one can. Um, uh, write down the Hamiltonian. So uh, now you see um, uh, the uh, minus h times sigma z term in the other uh, representation. So now can be written as sum over i. Now mu x i mu x i plus one minus j sum over i mu z of i. So that's the second term mapped to the first term in the previous Lagrangian is pretty obvious, but that uh, this first term uh, in terms of mu, mu x i and mu x i plus one also mapped to the second term in the previous Lagrangian is almost, uh, almost trivial. So here you see the map uh, that we have. Uh, basically, uh, exchanges the role of H and J. H becomes J and J becomes H. And that has a consequence for, um, uh, for our interpretation of different phases of the theory. So let's. Um, consider the situation in which J is much larger than H. So we know that this J multiply the product of two, two sigma X, right? And that term dominate in this uh, regime. That means that the spin want to be uh, in such a situation in which the X components of spins um, Point to the same direction. Um, the, 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 the ground state would like to be in the state where each the spin have all spin have uh, have the same um, um, z, uh, sigma x. 
So this is a situation of uh, Z2 symmetry breaking. The ground state breaks Z2 symmetry. Sigma X is equal to non-zero. And the ground state doesn't map to itself under um, uh, the Z2, which make map Sigma X to minus Sigma X. This is in one description in our original description, but with, if, what happened if you go to the mu description in the mu description, obviously J is now the new J because J and, and H are exchanged in the new description. J is much smaller than H. And here, um, the new phase is a phase in which um, we should associate this phase with the phase where Z2 symmetry uh, is unbroken. So it is the strange thing here that the duality uh, map uh, Z2 broken phase in one description to a Z2 unbroken phase in the other description. The uh, uh, I would have thought that you fix J being very, very bigger than H. And then when you do the transformation, uh, as you yeah. write the Hamiltonian, uh, yeah, the second term in the new description. Uh, yeah, this is, J, I, let me call that J mu was equal to the previous H and H I mu see. is now, yeah. In the new description, this, this let me call that J mu. This is uh, H mu. But the, the, the thing is that these two uh, phases um, map to each other. Um, in, in, in the same system, we have two, uh, the same system in, can be described in two different languages. In one language, we have an expectation value of a certain operator. Um, in the other phase, the ex this, this operator has a zero expectation value, but another operator, which is non-local, with respect to when we write it in terms of the previous operator, now have an expectation value. So is it clear that the Z2 is, is, is the same Z2? Because in the other description, the Z2 X on mu, uh, the Z2 that is unbroken X on mu, whereas in the first description, Z2 X on sigma. Yeah. So they look so like they're different is. Z2s. Yeah, it's a different Z2. Yeah, the, okay. uh, uh, the Z2 that is broken, um, another Z2, Z2, when it maps, that map mu into mu x to minus mu x is the one that is, uh, that is broken. I nice think about the Ising model in one plus one dimension, this quantum Ising model is that it makes um, a lot of strange things about quantum field theory very explicit. This one can work out step by step the map between two sides of duality and then look at the uh, operators. Um, uh, actually, this model can even be exactly solved, can be solved exactly. So when, um, probably I will not uh, tell uh, you in detail how uh, to solve this model exactly. It's the exact solution is uh, by uh, fermionization. That is uh, by mapping the spin operator to, um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to, um, to, to, to fermions. Maybe I write some notes and then uh, outline how, how that can be done. But you can also um, uh, you can also um, look at uh, Jordan. I think it's called Jordan Brickner. Um, I'm not uh, mistaken, this transformation. 
run map spin into um, into a fermion. And in terms of fermion, the theory is just theory of non-interacting fermions, which can be solved exactly. And again, in this fermionic uh, language, one can see the the fact that the two model has the same spectrum. This two model with J and H exchange have the same spectrum. Okay, is there any uh, other questions? Uh, not I'm going to uh, go to one more dimension. Now we are going to think about system in living in three uh, dimension. So it's either classical, so it's classical system, 3D classical system, which are equivalent to two plus one dimensional quantum uh, field theory. So um, maybe I'm going to write down a result first and then try to uh, show you how much we can um, do to justify or derive the result. So the result that I will uh, argue should be true is the duality between two theories. Now, these are not lattice theory, but these are full quantum field theories. So on one side of the duality, we have a field theory given by a familiar uh, Lagrangian. I'm going to write it's everything in Euclidean space. Nine plus m square pi plus lambda pi to the fourth. And on the other side, I have another theory where the Lagrangian is given by almost the same form plus tilde pi square plus like lambda tilde psi to the fourth plus one over four e square f mu u square. So one theory is a complex scalar field. Another theory is, so we would call that the abelian Higgs model. Usually these are very different theories. They are dual in the following sense. In the complex scalar field theory, uh, there are two different phases, two different uh, phases which can be uh, thought of as a phase where the potential uh, doesn't have, a has a minimum at zero. So it's, and the other phase where the potential looks like a Mexican hat potential. So since the the scalar field is complex. There is, it's actually, there is a manifold of uh, vacua, um, degenerate vacua, parameterized by a phase. So I call that the, uh, so this would be called, would be a spontaneously broken phase. And this is a spontaneously unbroken phase. So in between these two phases uh, is a phase quantum, is a phase transition. Uh, in the at the classical level, that phase transition happened when m square is equal to zero. Right? So here, and here it would be m square larger than zero, and this is m square smaller than zero. The reason I read I, I wrote this um, 
equality or inequality in quote because we know from quantum field theory this m square received um radiative correction so this would have we have to compute this diagram to get the effective mass of the particles and um when we write m square equal to zero it implies some kind of a renormal line renormalized mass not the original mass in the Lagrangian. So the statement of the duality is that in the vicinity, if we think about um, changing the mass from one side to the other side, the vicinity of this point, the vicinity of the phase transition as a function near m squared equal to zero is the same, is governed by the same physics as the vicinity of the transition between two different phases in the abelian six model. So in the abelian six model, there are two phases again, which can be thought of as a phase where we have no symmetry breaking. Uh, but when we say symmetry breaking, we have to be very careful here it's a gauge, the symmetry is gauge. So whenever you say there is a, a Higgs wave, et cetera, that these statements are not gauge invariant. So here I'm using a, uh, uh, um, intuitive but somewhat non-rigorous description of the phases. So in one phase, this m tilde square is larger than zero. Again, this m tilde square smaller than zero. All right, and here again, if we think about this m tilde square is something that runs the vicinity between these two uh, phases of the transition between these two phases. Is claimed to be governed by the same physics as the vicinity of um, of the uh, transition in the in the in the first theory. Now, one thing that um, it's not trivial to check is the mapping between the um, spectrum of the on the two two sides. We know that in the um, complex scalar field theory, on this side, on the spontaneously broken phase side, there is a Goldstone boson. A Goldstone that is massless, which disappear at the phase transition. Here on the other side, we have massless photon. So this massless photon um, in two plus one dimension has only one polarization in contrast to the photon in our three dimensional space. The polarization of the photon is a special direction perpendicular to its momentum. And so we can see here that there is a, the, at least at the level of counting the number of a massless degree of freedom, the uh, this phase, which we call the Cou Coulomb phase, map to the Goldstone phase of the complex scalar field theory. When you say it's dual, do you, are you tuning the lambda and lambda tilde and E? Because uh, uh, there are two couplings on the right hand side and one yeah. coupling on the left. You're uh -huh. tuning. There is, yeah, there is one coupling on, on this side, this lambda. So, um, so here, maybe I. I, I I will discuss a little bit what we mean by the uh, what what is the phase transition. Um, so in the in the complex scale of field theory, okay, so here I'm drawing the space 
of the um, some kind of space of um, uh, two parameter um, uh, a plane that each of the point correspond to a certain value of uh, mass and lambda. So, so um, let's say here I'm going to put here lambda here, put for example lambda, right? The renormalization group flow would uh, take us from some uh, along some trajectory in this two-dimensional uh, plane. Um, so let's ignore all the other um, interaction. Keep only mass and lambda phi four. So um, the phase transition correspond to a point, roughly speaking, when m squared is equal to zero. So I'm going to put this point here. But that point also is a fixed point in lambda. We call that lambda in two plus one dimension. Um, the naive dimension of phi four uh, coupling is, uh, is uh, relevant. Uh, the, this uh, coupling is relevant. So lambda uh, grows as we, start from some small lambda will grow. So in the UV, you can imagine the following. In the UV, we start from some point here. So here is our UV theory. Uh, we start with a theory, you would say negative mass square in the bare mass. And then we run, when we run the theory in the infrared, the mass square got um, the radiative correction and becomes larger and larger, less negative and negative. Okay, so the critical theory is obtained when we fine tune this mass so that it goes directly to this point. Go to this point. This is not a stable point in the RG sense, right? Is it it's has, one relevant deformation. This fixed point has one relevant deformation. We have to fine tune one parameter to, okay. to tune to that fixed point. Okay, so if we start from somewhere uh, a little bit larger, then we will find that this uh, renormalization group flow will take us to some M square that is uh, um, that is positive. If we start from somewhere Right here, it will the renormalization group flow will take us to here. So this corresponds to two phases. This is um, a spontaneous symmetry broken phase because m square is negative in the infrared. This one is a spontaneous symmetry uh, restored phase. There's no spontaneous symmetry uh, breaking. This is our understanding of the phase transition in the complex scalar field theory. Basically, it is um, one, um, one member of uh, uh, um, quite a simple class of uh, ON uh, model. This model is O2, O2 model. O2 because the U1 symmetry of complex scalar is O2, which can be um, generalized to ON. Uh, when N is equal to one, basically it's an Ising. It's an Ising model. Uh, when N goes to infinity, the problem can be solved exactly in a, another uh, way using the one over N ex uh, expansion. Analytically, we can do either uh, ON, N goes to infinity or Epsilon expansion in four minus E equal four minus Epsilon. But we know that the qualitative behavior that we get from Epsilon expansion holds in three dimension, the phase diagram, the features of the uh, um, of this um, uh, um, fixed point, the, the structure of the renormalization group flow is the same.
Okay, so we draw this line. Okay, yeah. So the claim here is that if we start So the claim here is that the um, the abelian in the abelian Higgs model, if we start from the UV appropriately, we can reach the um, fixed point. Um, so I'm just drawing some very uh, schematic because here I have M tilde square, I have lambda tilde, I also have E square. Yes, so the claim is that somewhere in this um, uh, uh, diagram, there is a point. Uh, here, let me just again put it, maybe I put it somewhere different schematically because the uh, somewhere here, for example, there is a fixed point and we can, we, there exists there exists this fixed point and that we can approach it uh, starting from some UV, uh, from the UV theory near. So the UV correspond to small, small lambda, small epsilon, small e, small uh, e square, with the coupling constant. So we start from some, some value of the mass and then we can reach this fixed point, just schematically uh, this way. And all the critical exponents between uh, the two sides should coincide. So the critical exponents, one of the critical exponents is how the uh, correlation length diverges as a function of the tuning parameter. So the correlation length need, should, um, should, uh, um, grows as one make the bare m square to be equal to the critical value of m square, and that I think the parameter here is called new. And uh, the claim is that here I have the same new, same critical exponent, and all the other critical exponents, not just new. Now you see this has a very different flavor than the uh, duality that we have talked about in the Ising model. Namely, these two theories, the theory in the UV are completely different. In the UV, in one theory has the theory of a scalar field. In the UV, sc the scalar interact weakly with each other. Um, the um, because the uh, the interaction is relevant, type four interaction is relevant. Relevant. Uh, in these two theory, one theory contains an additional photon, but as we go, flow these theories to the infrared, it's possible that they would approach the same fixed point. Okay, so maybe uh, I'll stop here with this field theory uh, description, and then uh, we'll continue a little bit later. Uh, but I want to give you the flavor of how this uh, duality, uh, what we sh should expect for this duality. So this duality has been uh, found uh, um, or argued to be uh, correct in a couple of papers, one by Peskin, I think in 1978, and the other by Halperin, Raskupta, 1980. As far as I can uh, see, they, they didn't know about uh, each other's work. 
men, but they are essentially the same. Uh, they are exactly, they, they were talking about exactly the same duality. Okay, so what I'm going to uh, tell you here follows more or less uh, uh, what is written in the paper by Peskin and Nouns of Physics. Maybe in slightly, um, and, but it's almost the same as what's written in, in Peskin. So um, the starting point of um, or the goal of this work is to uh, argue using lattice model that one can um, one can map one lattice model lattice model one, which can be thought of as some discretization of the, uh, of the uh, complex scalar field theory, of the phi theory, is uh, exactly equal to the another lattice model, lattice model two, which is a discrete version of the abelian six model. Now let's say, let, let us um, um, say right away from the start, even if one can prove that, that doesn't necessarily prove the few theoretical, few theoretical duality that we uh, have formulated because uh, we have to Additionally, prove that this lattice model has a fixed point, and that fixed point mapped to the same fixed point as the fixed point here. So you will see that uh, it's an additional. Um, this is an additional uh, complication that, or an additional assumption that we have to make. Okay, so let's see how far we can go with this program. So. When we start from a lattice model on this side, we can we, we can start by discretizing the uh, the, the scalar field theory, uh, but it turned out to be not the most convenient. Uh, there are too many, too much complication. Uh, um, the lattice model we want this lattice model to be as simple as possible. We, in order to uh, do that, we use a um, statement of universality, which used to be called the hypothesis of universality. But now most people believe this is true, that a critical point in a field theory depends only on the symmetries of the, the order parameter, but doesn't depend on the uh, uh, detail of the theory. So the critical point, fixed point, all the properties of the fixed point depends on symmetries only. In our case, it's a phase transition where this O2 uh, symmetry changes from being spontaneously broken to spontaneously unbroken. And that suggests a, a, a simpler, or at least the simplest, I think the simplest model with this is a lattice generalization of the Ising model in which at each point on the lattice, there is a O2 spin, not a, not a Z2 spin that can point only in uh, up and down direction, but a spin that can point in any direction on a plane, parameterized by an angle theta, basically, theta i. So the Hamiltonian of this model is minus sum, let's say, let me just put the overall coefficient in front to be just one. And here I have cosine of theta i minus theta j sum over all the uh, um, um, neighboring 
pair, pairs of neighboring indices, i and j, z would be equal to, again, sum of the whole partition, uh, the whole um, uh, ensemble, which is now integral over all the theta i, uh, all the theta i, and then I have e to minus uh, beta sum over i j cosine theta i minus theta j. This model is also called the xy model because uh, here we can think about each spin as a unit vector in an xy plane. So that's why it's called the xy model. Classical that is three dimensional, right? Uh, the lattice is three dimensional, yeah. So the lattice is three dimensional, but it's hard to draw. I have to do that. The three dimensional lattice. Uh, the spin is point in a two dimensional. Uh, that's two components. Yeah. So this is the uh, um, simple thing. Uh, sim seems to be the simplest model that um, when beta or the, the, the temperature is high, beta much less than one, for example, we have um, uh, we have a phase disorder phase. And when beta is much less, but than one, that is when uh, it costs energy to have the spin pointing in different direction, we have uh, all an order phase. In three dimension, there is no uh, no theorem that forbids such a transition in three dimension. So this X Y model can, in principle, we can do uh, many things with this. But uh, so now that um, it's really uh, much more convenient to modify this model a little bit, uh, uh, make it more suitable for duality. Uh, while preserving all the symmetry of the model, that is to go from this XY model, simple XY model to the so-called VLAN model. Which is, um, which makes a lot of formulas that I'm going to write much simpler. So in the XY model, there is this E to minus beta cosine of theta. Basically, right? we have this theta equal theta i and j. And the partition function um, inside the integral is a product of this function e to minus beta cosine of uh, theta and theta is the difference between the angle in the two sides i and j. So this, uh, this, uh, this, this function, if I plot it, cosine theta would have some form Took some some period. It's a periodic function with maximum around zero, two pi. But cosine is wait. Uh, I should have plus. Sorry, because the Hamiltonian has a minus sign. So e to minus beta is plus. E to plus beta cosine theta is uh, as uh, is a periodic function like this. And in the VLAN model, uh, this periodic function is uh, replaced by sum over n, and then e to minus beta uh, over two theta minus two pi n square. So the VLAN model replaced this function by another function, which is also periodic. And uh, it has the same, um, uh, kind of um, behavior near uh, each of these uh, maximum. I choose the coefficient here to be beta over two so that it mimics the exponents of the e to minus beta cosine, each one. So it's turn out that it's easier to start with not the uh, original XY model with the VLAN model and all the transformation is uh, uh, simpler. So Z the, in the VLAN model, let's write down what is the partition function. So 
So the partition function is uh, again integral over all spins. So, sorry, can we explain how this is periodic? Oh, this is periodic because um, uh, we have some here of, of over um, over and integer minus. n, right? So if I take so if I call this function say z, z of theta, and I change theta oh, I see. by two pi. Clearly, this can be compensated by yeah. changing n. Yeah, so it's a periodic function. So basically, it's a sum of Gaussian. Right? Yes. You, you see, all, all these are Gaussian shape, but I superimpose a lot of these Gaussian on top of each other. And yeah. we mix this exponent of, a, of the cosine that way. Since um, universality tells us that nothing depends on, on details, uh, uh, the fact here is that we still have a model, which I'm going to write down that preserves the, the O2 symmetry uh, is important, is the only important thing. Okay, here uh, I have instead of products of these exponents, of products over all the uh, pair xij of this function. This function, each of these function is a sum over uh, n, let's call nij, and then e to uh, minus beta over two, uh, theta i minus theta j minus two pi nij. A little bit uh, cumbersome, but that, uh, uh, that is our... Um, partition function. Now I'm going to outline how we can um, perform a duality transformation on this model. So first of all, um, this integral over theta, uh, originally they go from zero to uh, two pi, right? Um, but, without losing any, um, yeah, without, but I can, I, I'm going to extend the range to minus infinity to plus infinity. The reason I can do that is that basically, if I, if I have this uh, extended range from, from uh, minus infinity to plus infinity, I can, uh, uh, the, the partition function, what, what say stay inside the partition function has a gauge uh, symmetry, some kind of discrete gauge symmetry in which I can change theta i to a to an integer, uh, theta j to uh, two pi times an integer, two pi times another time integer, and nij can be changed to nij plus ni minus nj. And by using this gauge, I can map any configuration of theta to that where theta is between zero and two pi. So basically here I introduce some uh, in trivial infinite factor, uh, which can be factored out by choosing a certain gauge in which theta is between two and uh, zero and two pi. Okay, so I can, think about this integral over theta as from minus infinity to plus infinity without any problem. Now the uh, 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 square here. Yes. The first step that, uh, that, that um, um, was crucial step that Peskindet is to, to rewrite this Gaussian uh, through an auxiliary um, integral over an auxiliary field. So I have integral, original integral over theta variables, but I'm now introduced new integral over some variable bij. That lives on the links and rewrite this exponent as a Gaussian exponent over B. You can check that this, this is what um, the, the, the following will give you the uh, correct answer. So here 
what is being integrated again is um, into uh, um, so this this we have to uh, keep from minus infinity to plus infinity it should not and then here it's exponent going to write down minus beta ij square over eight pi square times beta plus i dij over two pi i beta i minus beta j minus two pi nij okay well you can mentally try to integrate over each of these d beta db here and the integral here is completely gaussian and this gaussian integral gives rise to this exponent of this expression square you know at this moment we just do a, a, a complete introduce just uh unphysical auxiliary field which no no dynamics basically into this lattice theory and the value of these introduction is now we can do integral over theta the integral over theta is particularly um, interesting so this we see each of these theta i in this expression multiply the b that is adjacent to it so this b i j so now that if we introduce this b there are six of this b that um adjacent to each each of these theta that would contribute And when doing this integral over d theta i, you find that sum over n, oh, I'm sorry, b i j, where j is neighbor of i has to be equal to zero. The integral over d theta is integral of, uh, it's like what would give the, uh, the delta function, set a delta function. This delta function of sum over dij over j that is a neighbor of i. Here, uh, dij is equal to minus bji. Uh, you seem to have frozen. Is that just me, or is it is everyone else experiencing that? <laughs> Same for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, oh, we lost him. Looks like yeah, he okay. disappeared. I feel like when there's a bad a bad lag like that it's almost better when he gets kicked out because then he knows that he's uh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can you hear me now yeah we can hear you now we so lost we, you for, okay. for a little bit maybe the well, last minute uh -huh. yeah, last a minute. minute so so uh, the in the um, uh, i was uh, explaining that integrating over theta uh the original theta uh, fields give rise to a constraints on b uh, basically the sum over b uh, that uh, comes out from one side is zero it is a some lattice version of the statement that b is a vector with a zero divergence so that's uh, that is the, uh, um, the the statement that is the delta function that we get so we can do integral over theta. So introducing this, there's um, the, the reason why, why we introduce the new variable is that we want to integrate over all our all variables. So we can do integrate, we can we integrate over this and get here um, instead of, uh, so this term would disappear. 
instead we have a constraint that uh, um, roughly divergence of d is equal to zero delta function of the divergence of b that's what we would get but now this uh, condition can be solved on the lattice and that's how the uh, gauge field of the dual theory, the uh, U, U1 gauge field of the Abelian Higgs model is going to, 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 to appear. Basically, B is going to be curve of A. But on the lattice, it looks like this. On the lattice, let me draw a lattice. So B lives on a length. And I'm going to introduce um, dual lattice with sites that have, instead of having integer coordinates, now have half integer coordinates. On the dual lattice is B, this line go through um, square. And I'm going to introduce my field A to live on, on the, each of these links. Then this, um, this statement basically say that B, B of this length is going to be the flux of A that is B called IJ is equal to B, uh, let me call that A, B, C, D axis. Uh, a, a, B plus A, B, C plus A, C, D plus A, D, A. That is basically the 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 uh, integral of the, um, the 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 integral of a over this uh, over the border of this uh, of this line. So you can check if with this um, definition and the asymmetry of a under exchanging the indices, the sum over all lines that go through that go, all, all the b's that uh, go from one particular uh, vertex. It's going to be some of uh, the uh, the uh, um, the circulation of a uh, around the, uh, the 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 side of a cube, and sum up to zero. So that's how the uh, constraint curve of b is equal to zero can be solved on the lattice by introducing a gauge field a now living on the links in the dual lattice. Okay, so that's that's. I think that is the most crucial step. So I'm not going to um, go further. Um, um, one can follow uh, Peskin, uh, but uh, I want to uh, point out. Uh, I want to 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 tell you what will happens. Um, what can happen in the intermediate steps. Uh, how, how far one can go. So how far one can go is that we can represent this Z as a sum over all configurations, M, so that let's call that M, call that called MIJ, some after certain uh, introduction of certain other um, auxiliary field playing with that. And then the, um, uh, it's sum over all configuration of M. Uh, this M is a discrete field. So they are like uh, from minus infinity to plus infinity, but have discrete integer values. And then roughly speaking, we have this integral over DIA, path integral, but discretized. And then the action is exponent of minus something very similar to the Maxwell action discretized in plaquette, sum over plaquette, plus sum over ij, which is m ij, a ij, i, yes. It's some two pi that I'm, um, and the, in this sum, there is a constraint of, again, diff of m is equal to zero.
this is actually uh, how far one can get uh, at the when if we insist on exactness of the transformation. All that's happened later required certain uh, physical intuitions or approximations, combination of both. Uh, so here, and, yeah. And you have about five minutes. Sorry, yeah, I have uh, five minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm going to finish here with this. Uh, I'm uh, uh, going to interpret this M. So this M is, is something that has divergence equal to one. I'm going to interpret this M. I, I, let's imagine that M can be either one or minus, minus one. When divergence is one, then it's basically some kind of line on the lattice. And this is one, this is one, and so the divergence here is zero, and here is, let's, see, let's consider just, um, although M can be two, three, etc. consider the case when there is a continuous line of M equal to one. And that line can be interpreted as a word line. I'm going to interpret it as a word line of a charged particle. Can be interpreted as a word line of a charged particle interacting with a through uh, term here, which is now nothing but the discretized version of bx mu a mu of x exponents of the Wilson line associated with this particle. And so we can imagine that if we know how to solve this theory exactly, that we map to uh, 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 um, some kind of a word line formulations of a theory of particles interacting with a gauge field. Uh, this word line can be thought of as creation of uh, particle whole pairs or particle goes uh, from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, so that's the step that required a certain uh, physical intuition and argument. But at the end, if we, we can see the goal, at least from here, we can see the end point that is the Abelian six model. And that's what Peskin and Harper and Das Gupta argue at the end that this uh, uh, lattice calculation suggests that there is a duality between two uh, scalar field theory, two, two bosonic field theory, one complex scalar field and the other is, um, is um, uh, Abelian six model. So right now this uh, uh, duality um, um, is sometimes called the bosonic particle vortex duality. We are, we'll explain why it's called particle vortex duality next time. Uh, and then next time we will, I will uh, jump to more modern topics a fractional quantum hole effect and uh, fermionic a particle vortex duality. Hmm. Any question? Thanks a lot for that. Um, let's have some quick questions. I, I have one. Uh... How do I see that this is a U1 gauge field? Uh, so this A here is um, through its uh, introduction. Um, here, uh, this A is, um, this A is basically a discretized version of the uh, Wilson line. So it's, it's, it's like discretized uh, version of A mu. Mm -hmm. right. and B is, it's, um, so, it's a curve. I'm not sure I understand your question. It's clearly not a, a non abelian gauge field. Because there is no, like in the field of strength, there is no like other terms. Is that, 
that is that why right uh, but it's just one component of the of the field strength which is d and the mm -hmm. uh, its energy it's I think we lost you again. Yes, I think. Action is, you lost uh, me? Uh, yeah, we hear you now, I think. Hello? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so from this uh, map, we can see that this gauge field is, uh, is just P1. There is, it's not, what appears here is just uh, uh, um, an abelian. Uh, gauge field uh, non compact, even. Uh, we again lost you. Maybe it's because my video is on. Well, I, I think maybe we'll uh, we'll stop the recorded questions with the with this one. Hopefully, oh, no, hopefully the chat come back. Is that, is that